All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I wanna welcome you to this week's Impact Hour. We have a very special Impact Hour uh, this week. Uh, we're actually doing a virtual book launch and uh, we are welcoming Dr. Alan Cole, uh, who has uh, just uh, finished publishing his book, Counseling Persons with Parkinson's Disease. And uh, this is very um, special to me and our team here at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. Um, at, Dr. Cole is a dear uh, colleague and friend. Um, he's been with the school for over seven years now. And uh, Dr. Cole serves as a Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Professor um, in the School of Social Work. Uh, he is also, by courtesy, a professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Dell Med School. And his current research and teachings include uh, chronic um, illness, um, health humanities, and social work, and re religious and spiritual spirituality. Um, Dr. Cole's published 13 books, and this is his latest book, which I think is by far a labor of love. Um, and I just want to say, um, Dr. Cole, how much we appreciate you at the school. Uh, being a member of Academic Affairs, you're, I've always said you're our fearless leader. And uh, we just love having you and your family, uh, Tracy um, and Meredith and Holly, as part of our family. And appreciate that you are sharing this experience with us. Well, it's my honor, Jennifer. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you for the work you do for the school and the Donito Center. And uh, I want to thank everyone who's in attendance today. I, um, I see a lot of uh, names that are familiar, uh, close to me personally and professionally. Um, and it's really a delight to, to be able to launch this book in such a uh, warm company. So thank you all for being here. All righty. Well, today we're uh, we're going to have a, a virtual book launch, uh, which is something new to I think many of our participants and myself and Dr. Cole. But we thought we'd uh, start with um, a few questions, and uh, Dr. Cole will also be doing uh, some readings from the book. So, um, Alan, tell us what is Parkinson's disease. Well, Parkinson's is a, a neurological disorder. It's um, a, a progressive illness that uh, involves uh, movement of, of many types within your body and also has an effect on your mood. Um, it, it begins when uh, neurons in your brain and a, a portion of the brain called the substantia nigra start to die off. And over time, many, many years, um, the, that dying off process lowers your dopamine level in your, in your brain, which is primarily um, uh, responsible for movement. And then with other neurotransmitters is responsible for mood. So uh, people with Parkinson's will, will have symptoms like uh, tremors. That's probably the most recognizable uh, uh, symptom uh, that those can be in your, you know, in your limbs and in your, your trunk, your head, they can be internal uh, it, it's quite uh, complex, actually. Uh, and then slowness of movement, rigidity, stiffness, um, autonomic kinds of things like uh, digestion and sleep and involuntary movements, things like that. Um, and, and it's progressive. It, it, it doesn't get better. It gets worse over time. Uh, it varies in, the, in, in its progression among people. Uh, it's, it's really sort of a, um, a boutique disease, we call it, or um, a, a disease of one, it's sometimes called because it, it presents so differently in, in different people. Um, and about 10 million people worldwide, ha worldwide have Parkinson's. Uh, about 1 million Americans uh, have Parkinson's and, and about 60,000 Americans are diagnosed each year. Um, it, it's frequency uh, of, of diagnosis is, is, is increasing. More people are being diagnosed each year, so its rates are increasing. Um, and people who are diagnosed under the age of 50 are said to have young onset or early onset Parkinson's. That's about 1% of, of those, 1% to 4% of those who, who have Parkinson's in general. Um, and the average age of diagnosis is about uh, age 60. 
Um, so the, the disease is increasing in its um, um, impact and its numbers, and we're not exactly sure why. We have some hunches. I can talk about that, uh, but it's uh, it's not going away. Um, the good news is treatments are getting better, and we're getting much closer to uh, to a cure. I can talk about that too, but um, that that's sort of the, the landscape as we as we see it right now. And tell us uh, what um, how did this book come to be? Well, I was working on a, actually another book with, with um, Dana Bliss, who's the executive editor at Oxford University Press um, and, and a close friend now. And he and I had begun working on another book project and I received this diagnosis and, and I reached out to Dana. He was one of the very first people I reached out to. And I said, you know, um, I want us to work together. I think I need to write a different book. And um, for a number of weeks and months, he graciously, um, you know, entered into a conversation with me about that. And um, I wanted it to be personal. I, I felt like, um, you know, my, my, my story, both as a, as a person who educates counselor types, social workers and other counselor types, but also as a person who is now living with, with Parkinson's that I might have some, you know, um, sort of distinctive takes on it that, that might be important to, to add to the conversation. And, and Dana and his wise and, and generous manner, you know, helped me think about how to structure the book and, um, you know, to, to sort of do a both and kind of book. So it, it's sort of, you know, part memoir, part uh, sort of guidebook for counselors and um, social work types. And um, hopefully we, we were able to pull that off. Great. Would you like to do a reading for us? Sure, thank you. Um, this uh, is a reading that begins the book, actually, and it's it's sort of representative of the, the sort of genre of, of the alternating chapters. So the book is structured in a way that sort of personal memoir chapters frame uh, the, the sort of professional chapters. And, and this is from chapter one, and it's called Beginning. I sit comfortably at the cherry colored wooden desk in my campus office located in the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. I can look out my window and see the university's iconic tower and the Darrell K. Royal Memorial Stadium where my favorite team since childhood, the Texas Longhorns play football on Saturdays. Having lived in Dallas for a few years as a child, pulling for the Dallas Cowboys and Texas Longhorns was my first religion. Rows of coveted books sit on shelves that line the wall behind me, books I began acquiring more than 30 years ago while in college and graduate school. These books have titles such as The Varieties of Religious Experience, Essays of Ralph Waldo Emerson, The Cambridge Companion to Kierkegaard, and Narrative Means to Therapeutic Ends. Together they tell a story of both my professional path as well as my existential searches. As squealing bus brakes announce the arrival of students for early morning classes, I take quick sips of warm coffee between spurts of typing on my computer. My thoughts flow and I'm excited as something new begins to live on the page. My left hand, like my left wrist and forearm, has been stiff for months. It tries to keep pace with my right hand's more fluid actions. A sudden twitch in my left index finger disrupts my work. Each time I extend the finger, such as when reaching for the T key, it shakes quickly back and forth. You know how a parent shakes a finger when telling her child no or not to do something? This is the kind of movement my finger is making, and I cannot stop it. It does not move when I have it at rest on the keyboard or desktop, but anytime I use it purposefully, such as when typing or pointing at something, it swings back and forth like an erratic pendulum on a wall clock. I chalk it up to having drunk too much coffee and I do not think much more about it. However, that afternoon it keeps on twitching and the same thing happens the next morning. So that was the beginning, and I, I sort of 
you know, tell the story of, of you know, the, the first twitch, if you will, to, you know, the path of diagnosis, which was complicated and uh, sort of the, the story of the first year and a half, two years of, of my journey. I think we um, chalk a lot of things up to too much coffee. <laughs> Um, as I read through the book, I felt it was um, very unique in that it was part memoir, but also part instructional, instructional and actually counseling from a patient's perspective. Um, would you say that that is a unique approach? Yeah, I don't know if it's unique. Um, again, harking back to my conversations with, with Dana, um, he had done another book. Um, on a very different subject, actually on domestic abuse and, and, and child custody um, it, within domestic abuse cases uh, by a lawyer, uh, a woman attorney. And um, she writes about her own experience as a victim of domestic abuse and um, negotiating the, the legal system and, and trying to um, you know, gain custody of her children. And um, you know, that became sort of a framework for what became the book that, that we did together. So I don't, I don't know that it's unique entirely, but I, I do think it's, um, I don't know of another book sort of in, in my world of, of sort of clinical circles and um, certainly in the Parkinson's world that I know of that, that tries to um, sort of use memoir as a, as a portal into um, what is a broader, a much broader experience. And, and it's important for me to say that, you know, as a social work educator in particular, that, um, you know, my story is a story of one person. Uh, I don't in, uh, presume to speak for everyone, but I, I hope that my story is at least an invitation into uh, learning more about others' stories. And, you know, in social work education, we always remind ourselves that, that we have to start, you know, where the other person is or where the client is. And uh, that's, that's really important for me to underscore too. But I do think, um, you know, having a glimpse into another story can help us understand our own story better, perhaps, uh, but also as professionals can, can give us maybe some insights and, and some awarenesses that we might otherwise not have. So that, that's the intention in trying to structure the book this way. I also really like the um, combination of both theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge, um, and just you know the social and emotional pieces of chronic disease all in one book. I I, I really enjoyed that. Well, unique perspective. Yeah, thank you. And and I, and I want to say too that I hope the book is accessible. It, you don't you don't need to have a master's in social work or to be a professional counselor to read it, I, I don't think. I, I think it's really um, intended to be a book that, you know, family members and care partners and people with Parkinson's themselves, along with counselor types, can read and, and, and benefit from. I've, I've, I've tried to write a book that, that, that um, speaks to all of those audiences. And it's compelling in the beginning, it draws you in. Thank you. Um, one of the things also um, that you write about throughout the book is just um, dealing or people dealing with chronic illness in a public arena and sharing their diagnosis publicly. Um, can you tell us a little more about that piece? Yeah, so as I detail in the book, you know, it took me the better part of a year to be public with, with my diagnosis. And, um, you know, I want to say that that like Parkinson's, everyone's sort of journey toward being public is, is one's own. There's never a one size fits all. You know, I know people who immediately tell the world and I know people who for a decade or more uh, keep it very private, you know, to, to themselves and, and maybe a very small network of trusted family members and friends. And all of the above is, is fine. Um, but for me, it became, um, a secret that, that became increasingly burdensome. And I felt like um, I wasn't able to live authentically in ways that are important to me. And I had young children at the time. My daughters are now, you know, 13 and 15, but they were, you know, 10 and eight when I was diagnosed. And, um, you know, my keeping it to myself really cut against a lot of the values that 
that Tracy, my wife and I were, were trying to instill in our daughters about, um, you know, facing adversity and, and living with authenticity and um, things that I try to instill in, in my students as well, right? And so for me, it became this sort of jarring um, experience to, to be so private about it and yet to tout the virtues of, of being public to, to other people. Um, and, and so I made the decision to, to you know, obviously Tracy and, and, and Dana and, and, you know, two or three other people very close to me knew my parents didn't know. And so the first conversation I had to have with, you know, others beyond that immediate circle, you know, was with my parents. I didn't want them to worry about me, which parents do. Um, and, you know, I needed some time to sort of get my own mind around living with, with this illness and what that would mean. And so I told my parents, and then a few weeks later, I told my children. And then, of course, when I told them, I had to tell the world because, you um, they were 10 and eight and uh, they needed to, to know that it was okay to tell the world. And so after I told my children, the next day I told my, my boss, Dean Zayas. And then very shortly after that, I, 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 you know, sent word to all my colleagues and networks and um, you know, it, it was a relief and, you know, I was scared to death on the one hand because I, I didn't want people to pity me and I didn't want people to look at me differently and to treat me differently. Um, on the other hand, I needed to be honest and authentic. And, you know, um, everything I feared really um, has has not come to pass. And, and so many things I never imagined that are beautiful and, and sort of empowering have come to pass. And so for me, it was the right decision um, at the right time. And, and then, of course, I wanted to try to do something good with it and, and to use it for something constructive. It, for me, that was a way to find some meaning um, in this very jarring, you know, experience that I never would have anticipated at, at 48 years old. And, um, you know, now 53, almost five years in, um, that work has become even, even more meaningful and more sustaining and, and I hope has, has helped build community within the Parkinson's uh, world and, and also beyond. What do you think can help to encourage um, people to be more public about their health conditions? Well, I think um, a couple of things come to mind. I, I think it, we, we need a society that is more compassionate and understanding of people who live with all kinds of illnesses, mental illnesses, physical illnesses, um, whether they're chronic or progressive or terminal, um, we, we need to be more um, um, compassionate about that. And I think we need to find ways to talk about it more comfortably. It's, um, it's difficult to talk about illness. Um, many well-intentioned in people avoid talking about it uh, because they don't know what to say. And I think you know, those of us who live with illnesses um, have an opportunity to, to, to maybe become more comfortable ourselves and, and to create those spaces where we can invite other people into the conversation. Um, I want to say also that, um, you know, there are a lot of risks in doing that. There are, are, you know, personal risks and there are professional risks. There are a lot of misperceptions about Parkinson's disease, as there are about many uh, illnesses that, that people live with. Um, and, you know, education and advocacy and all of that is, is part of the, the solution on that front. Um, I, I could go on and on. There are policy implications or, you know, I'm a big proponent of, um, you know, everybody having access to health care and, and all of that. That goes beyond the scope of our talk today. But um, I, I think it's a it's an effort that both individuals who uh, live with illness need to make and, and, and that larger, you know, communities and societies of people need to be challenged on. Do you consult with um, other um, people that you know that are experiencing Parkinson's and have Parkinson's on how to go public with that? Like say if they're not in the school of social work or a place that, you know, might be might show a little more grace, I guess, than a typical work environment. Yeah, and I really appreciate that question. Um, I, I feel very privileged in, in what I do and where I do it. And 
you know, I have protections, you know, both legally and employment wise that, that, that everybody doesn't enjoy. And so I, I want to, I want to make sure I say that, um, you know, I know people who, uh, people reach out to me um, fairly regularly on this question. And I, and I try to say, look, you're going to know best, you know, when and how and if to, to, to disclose the problem with Parkinson's is eventually people know, right? Um, because your symptoms become such that you can't, you can't hide them. And the medications are really good. And, you know, a lot of people can, can sort of stay under the radar for many, many years, but eventually um, people are going to know something is going on. And, you know, I know stories of, of folks who, who, you know, reveal that people at work thought they were drinking at work or that they, because their balance was off or their speech was off or um, they hadn't slept and they were, you know, falling asleep and, you know, things that are fairly common for Parkinson's, particularly as the disease progresses, um, um, that's going to be obvious. So at some point people have to, to reveal it when and how they do it. Um, it's a case by case, you know, decision. Um, it's a risk. And I think, you know, I was on a call last night with a group of young onset folks who several of whom have just been diagnosed. And I really advise people to see an attorney, an employment law attorney, just to sort of know what their rights are and what, what the obligations of their employers are, um, because they vary from industry to industry and sector to sector. But the law is on the side of people with, with chronic illnesses um, who are protected by the American with Disabilities Act and, and who, who have rights and, and um, processes that they can and should make use of as they're negotiating that, that path. Thank you. That's really good advice. Um, in your opinion, what helps people live better with Parkinson's disease? Well, on the physical side, we know that, that exercise is as good a medicine as anything. Um, replicated studies um, have shown that, that, you know, regular vigorous exercise actually slows down progression. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to run marathons. You, you know, you can walk or, you know, do yoga or Tai Chi or, uh, you, you know, anything that you enjoy. Uh, rowing. I mean, anything that gets your heart rate up and gets your body moving is, is, is great. But, but exercise is really key. And um, uh, any neurologist or movement disorder specialist or social worker or any healthcare professional working with movement disorders will, will tell you that's where you have to start. Um, I also think connection is, is as important. And, um, you know, Parkinson's can be very isolating because of, you know, the social stigma that can come with it. People, you know, are sometimes embarrassed about their symptoms or they're ashamed to um, admit they have Parkinson's, which, you know, rationally is, is irrational if you think about it in those terms. But on an emotional level, you know, no one wants to sort of stand out and be different and um, things like that. But, um, you know, I would say that, you know, to the extent that people can, you know, come become comfortable with that. And my experience has been that being with other people who have Parkinson's can go a long way to sort of normalizing that you know, that experience. Uh, so connection, I think, is really important. I, I, I'm involved in a number of groups that, you know, are, are uh, made up of people living with Parkinson's, but also advocates of, uh, of those people and, um, um, you know, organizations that raise money for research and, you know, better programs and better ways of living. I think that's really, really important. I also think, you know, doing what you love, uh, pushing yourself, um, Knowing that Parkinson's isn't a death sentence, you, you know, people can and do live many, many, many decades with Parkinson's. Uh, you don't die from Parkinson's, you die with Parkinson's. And so life, life isn't over. Um, it can still be good. And um, um, it, it can be, it will be different for, for most of us, but, but it can still be very good. So I try to remind people of that and, and encourage them to be in groups of people who can uh, remind them of that. One last thing, finding a good neurologist is key. Someone trained in movement disorders is, is really vital. Um, and then a care team. I mean, people with Parkinson's need a good, um, you know, general practitioner as, a, as their, their primary care doctor. 
um, over time, maybe physical therapist, speech therapist, occupational therapist, um, um, a, a therapist for uh, their mental health. I mean, it, it really takes a, a village or a team, particularly over the long haul as you get decades into the disease to, to live well. In addition to all the professionals you mentioned, I really like that you talk about physical exercise and connection because really like we would all do better with more of that. Yeah, I, I well remember. said, well yes. said. Um, but since you did mention physical exercise, I have to ask you about the marathon that you ran. Tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, well, I got involved you know, pretty early on. I'm going to read about this in, in a little bit. But um, you know, I was always active and um, you know, athlete as a kid and in college. And always, I was kind of a gym rat kind of person. Didn't particularly enjoy running. But, but Tracy, my wife, has been a, an avid runner, marathoner for a long time. And um, I, I tell people she's the runner and I'm the person who runs. But, um, you know, she sort of got me into to running. And then I became involved with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research and Team Fox. And, um, you know, did a half marathon and, and then, you know, did a marathon and then ended up doing two additional marathons to, to raise money for, you know, Parkinson's Research and, and, and uh, to educate and raise awareness and um, yeah, but, but you don't have to run marathons. I mean, that's the point, right? You can do anything that you like and that's good for your body. And, um, and, that, and that's just as, uh, just as good. Maybe over the long haul, it's better for you than running marathons, better, better on your body. <laughs> I think it just shows that you're an overachiever. Well, <laughs> I don't play golf, so I have to do something. You know. um, can we have another reading now? Sure. Um, this is, let me set this up just a little bit. This is um, from chapter three, I think it is. Um, it's titled Worrying. Yeah, chapter three. And um, so 11 days after my, my clinical diagnosis, which, which happened in the, the neurologist's office, 11 days after that, uh, Tracy and Meredith and Holly and I went to New York because she was going to run the New York Marathon. And, you know, a couple of days after we returned from that trip, I had an appointment for what is called a DAT scan, which is sort of like an MRI or a CAT scan. It's brain imaging, but it's, um, it's used in certain cases um, to confirm a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is diagnosed in, in sort of um, not terribly complicated ways, but, but people have to be trained to, to sort of understand what they're seeing. But it's sort of a, a, an office exam where you do things with your hands and you walk and you you know, um, do things that a neurologist asks you to do. And then they make a clinical diagnosis, but sometimes they, they want you to have a brain scan just to confirm that. And my doctor said, you know, your symptoms are very subtle. You're very young. Um, I want to just do this. I don't do it often, but, but I want to do it in this case, just to confirm the diagnosis. And so I'm, I'm reading from a, a portion of the chapter that, that recounts some of that, that, uh, that scan experience. We returned to Austin from New York, and two days later, Tracy drops me off at Austin Radiology Associates, just a mile or so from our home. It's 10 a.m. on a Wednesday morning. She wants to come in with me, but given that we will not get the DAT scan results immediately, I tell her I will just go in by myself and that I'll text her when I'm finished. We plan for her to pick me up a couple of hours later and then drive me home before the girls get out of school. I check in and take a seat in a small waiting room with textured walls the color of beach sand. Sitting alone, I hear soft music playing in the background. Coffee, cookies, and other snacks are available on a small counter, but I have no appetite for them. After a few minutes, a young and artsy looking woman appears and she invites me to follow her into the bowels of the imaging center to the prep room. She has short, spiky blonde hair with light pink streaks. We sit down and she asks me a series of questions as she checks boxes and writes short notes on a printed form. At one point, I interrupt her. How often do you do a DAT scan? Rarely, and we're one of the few places in town that has the machine, she says. 
She gives me a Xanax tablet to relax me and prepares an injection of a radioactive isotope, iodine-123. It will make my brain glow for the camera when she sticks me into a machine that wraps my head like the contents of a burrito. Watching her work, I try to absorb the multicolored peace sign tattooed on the inside of her pale wrist. I wonder why she chose it and whether it helps her feel calm. The drug kicks in and I begin to feel more relaxed. I show her the slight tremor in my left index finger and her forehead wrinkles and her lips puff out. After a moment of silence, she says, they ordered this scan for that. I exhale. I sit there for a few more minutes before she escorts me even further back into the building to the imaging room. There she hands me off to another tech who is all business. He wears blue surgical scrubs, has curly graying hair, a stocky build, and looks about my age. He has little to say. When he walks me over to the hard gray table, I lie down on it and try without success to feel comfortable. He positions my head, straps it down tightly, and returns to the other side of the room, taking his seat at mission control. My head begins to hurt and my scalp burns. Try not to move, he says. The room is cold and almost dark. Only a small desk lamp that hangs over his control board permits me to catch periodic glimpses of him in my peripheral vision. The scan starts and for about 20 minutes, he presses buttons that operate the camera tube. I hear its geary movements whine against the white noise of a loud, chilling fan. Finally, the camera stops moving. He flips a switch for a faint light, which allows me to see him approach the table. When he unstraps me, the burning sensation on my scalp subsides, but my head still hurts. He helps me stand and walks me back to the same room I was in earlier. Still drowsy, I shuffle over to a hospital bed and lie quietly on my back. This room is cold too, even after the artsy woman brings me a thick blanket and some juice. As I cover up and fight off sleep, my mind wanders from family to Michael J. Fox, to disabled people I have known, to work and back to family. I cannot get warm. Thank you for sharing that. I told you my voice might crack a couple of times, so. Uh, Did good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, what were some of the feelings that were going through your head at that time? Well, I, you know, was still hoping against hope that, you know, my neurologist had it wrong, but, you know, I, I knew my, my body hadn't felt right for looking back a couple of three years, you know, I had symptoms that I just sort of dismissed because I was pushing 50 and I was active and I said, well, I'm overdoing it at the gym. And, you know, there has to be some uh, explanation other than this, but I, you know, I was beginning to get, you know, my head around it, no pun intended. And um, I, I knew, but, but hoped that I would have, you know, different news. And I, and I, I, I share kind of how the rest of that unfolded in the book, but, um, you know, it was a sobering experience, but it, it also, um, it opened my eyes to see the world and to see um, people and, and suffering and illness in ways that, um, that I hadn't before. And I like to think that I was a sensitive and, and aware and in tune person, but, um, Certainly, this experience, you know, sharpened my my vision for a lot of these things. And so, um, you know, I was worried about my future. I was worried about, you know, my my job and 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 um, all the things I talked about earlier. And it sort of it sort of crystallized in that, you know, half hour or an hour I was in that recovery room, sort of thinking about what lies what would lie ahead. I know sometimes with um, chronic disease and also um, cancer or other diagnosis that just 
getting the confirmation and, you know, having the information, you know, that information can sometimes just make you feel better because now, you know. Yeah. Okay. Now the question is, you know, what do I do to, to, yeah. to do something good with this and to live my best life? It took me a little, it took me a little while to get there. I wasn't there on that table, but uh, that was the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I bet it takes, you know, I don't think anybody gets there right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what does the future look like with respect to treating Parkinson's, mm -hmm. curing Parkinson's? Yeah. The, I mean, the future is bright. Um, we're, you know, we, we have good medicines for Parkinson's. Uh, they're getting better all the time. I mean, you know, monthly, it seems like something new is, um, you know, close to being rolled out. If it isn't being rolled out, there are, you know, dozens upon dozens of clinical trials that are being, you know, conducted in, in research centers across the country and across the world. Um, people I trust in the medical community who are very knowledgeable, you know, tell me we're close. And, you know, I believe that, that we're close. Um, I, I've devoted my life to trying to help us get closer and um, at the same time, you know, life is to be lived in the moment and each day enjoyed. And, and so I don't, um, I don't put everything on there being a cure for Parkinson's in my lifetime. I, I think it's certainly possible or certainly um, that we'll have better treatments that, that um, keep uh, progression from, you know, occurring or e even maybe turn the clock back some. Um, I really believe that'll happen, but um, in the meantime, I'm I'm living my life and 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 trying to uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the moment. I'm gonna um, step away from the um, being the person that's diagnosed with Parkinson's to being the care um, care. I don't want to say caregiver, but care partner. Care partner, yeah. Care partner. And um, we're also a counselor or a social worker, somebody who works closely with people with chronic disease. Um, tell me advice that you might share. Well, I think it's like any population of people that, that clinicians work with or that, that care partners work with. I, I think we, we want to... Um, learn about their experience from, from, from them, right? We wanna, um, you know, in the book, I talk about, you know, a, phen a phenomenological approach to counseling. We want experience near kinds of uh, data and that those come best from listening to people who are living the, the experience, right? Um, educating ourselves on, on Parkinson's and other kinds of, you know, chronic and progressive illnesses, I think is, is really important recognizing that it's not a one size fits all, just like it's never a one size fits all for any kind of, uh, you know, clinical mental health or, or, or health need. Um, and, <clears throat> and again, trying to, you know, recognize on the one hand, the, um, the reality that, that, that chronic and progressive diseases are chronic and progress. But on the other hand, they don't have to be, um, necessarily a, a death sentence and um, they don't have to be sort of the end to to one's life um, that the good things can 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 happen and by virtue of, of having these conditions and um, I, I think trying to frame it over time with people in, in sort of a both and way is really important which which clinicians do all the time right we want to help people you know recognize the reality of what they're they're dealing with so that they're not living in denial but also, um, you know, from a, a strengths-based perspective to say what, um, you know, what good can come of this, you know, what relationships can be healed, what um, things have you put off that you can now do, what, um, you know, can you, can you use your story to, to do that helps other people in their journey? I mean, all those kinds of things I think are important to, to think about. Thank you. In the book, you write about several life lessons um, that you've learned um, from a life with Parkinson's. And I like the way that you weave them into the book. And um, can you share some of those with us? Some yeah, and I'm gonna, in my last reading, I'm gonna touch on a couple of those, but I'll mention two or three here. Um, 
know, I'm an educator. I, I'm a I'm an academic, and so I'm always sort of looking for lessons or or, or things to take away from from experiences, whether they're they're positive or negative or or or, or both and. And and so I started, you know, trying to discern what I'm learning from Parkinson's and, you know, truly ways that, that it's really sort of enhanced my life. I mean, I tell people I'm not, I'm not yet ready to say I would have signed up for this, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's made me a better person. Um, it, it's, again, opened my eyes to things that I didn't see as clearly as I wanted to see and that I now see. And it's brought extraordinary people into my life that I would not have met otherwise. And um, you know, all of that again gives it meaning and um, you know, um, experiences of love and support and empowerment that otherwise would be missing. And so, um, you know, one life lesson I think is that um, that that personal connections and relationships are really important. And um, I was always a pretty private person. Um, I was much better at you know, helping people talk about their feelings. And I was, uh, was it talking about my own and, uh, you know, Parkinson's has, has helped all of that. And, and so I, um, would, would want to note that in, in this conversation. Um, it's also, you know, taught me that, um, people need other people, you know, for healthcare and for, um, emotional support and for inspiration and for um, solidarity. And I, I write a lot about that in the book, how, how the Parkinson's community, you know, my, my band of brothers and sisters, um, you know, how we walk daily in solidarity with one another. And um, that would be uh, something I, I wouldn't enjoy otherwise. And I'm, and I'm grateful for, for that and more. And I'll touch on a couple of additional life lessons in the in the last reading. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I, we have some questions from the audience that Great. I wanna get to, and one of them Great. kind of falls in line with what um, you were just speaking of. Um, can you speak to the spirituality aspect of the book and how it impacts um, how you deal with your diagnosis? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, of that in the book, you know, um, some of it implicit in a couple of places more explicit. I, I write a, about a, an experience I had um, in, in Vatican Square when my family, um, you know, went to, went to Italy, went to Europe and, and, and into Italy one summer. And, and I was still not public about Parkinson's and my kids didn't know. And um, I, I write about sort of that, that, experience from from a spiritual standpoint so I won't give that away but you know any kind of jarring life experience illness you know relationship changes job changes um, but certainly illness can can really call you to question what you believe what your values are what your priorities are um, it can certainly prompt you to face your mortality in some new ways. And, you know, all of those things have spiritual dimensions for some of us, maybe most of us, if not all of us. And so um, part of my sort of coming to terms with, with having Parkinson's was happening against the backdrop of, of, of some of the questions that I thought I had sort of answered for myself, at least provisionally about, um, you know, what um, forces are at work in the world and sort of what, um, you know, justice involves and fairness and, you know, all of that kind of stuff that uh, equity um, and, and sort of, you know, promises that we assume we have been made or have been made for us and then those that, that haven't. And so, um, you know, I, I don't want to give too much of it away and, and it, it's, it's more implicit than explicit, but I think you know, for many of us, our, our coping strategies will involve, you know, some appeal to spiritual or religious resources. And certainly the way we frame our experiences, and our worldview will be, you know, shaped by that. And, you know, for me, that was certainly the case, is certainly the case now. 
Um, and, and, you know, I talk with people who, who say, you know, I, I was a faithful person and I lost my faith because of this experience and, and others who say that, um, you know, this has made me, um, you know, more dependent on my faith or my spirituality or my belief system. And, and I think for me, it would, you know, I would align more with the latter that I think it's really been a, um, kind of a confirmation of, of sort of the values that I, I tried to embrace and to, to live with before Parkinson's, those have become even more important since. How does your work with PDYs, which um, for our audience, PDYs is Alan's uh, blog. And tell us how you came to the name PDYs, first of all. Well, PD for Parkinson's disease, right? And, and wise is, is kind of a, a play on words. It's sort of wise in the sense that it, it having to do with. So it's, it's, you know, PD wise, it's sort of like having to do with. And then wise sort of, you know, um, implying at least a, a search for some kind of wisdom, right, around this experience. And, you know, I, I write, you know, most of the articles for PDYs, but I invite other people to write as well and, and do interviews with, um, you know, renowned neurologists and, and you know, leaders of, of organizations that are, you know, uh, really shaping the, the, the Parkinson space. And, and then others who, you know, share their experiences too, whether it's in narrative form or poetry or interviews, it's, it's, it's not just about my experience, but about our collective experience. Um, and this came about, if I may, just real quickly, I was in New Haven, Connecticut, you know, for a, a talk um, and having dinner with a friend of mine, Chris Tracy, who also has Parkinson's disease. And um, we were talking about, you know, sort of a, a need in the community for a space where these kinds of um, stories could be shared and conversations could be had. And um, it was something we were hungering for ourselves. And so you know, that was the impetus for, for launching PDYs. And, um, you know, it's, it's been, uh, uh, it's almost two years since we launched it and, you know, our, our readership is growing and, and, and I'm still enjoying it and, and I hope it continues. How does your work with PDYs and the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, fulfill your journey? Well, again, I think, you know, for me, it was about finding some meaning in this experience, right? And, and I think, I mean, one, I've learned so many things from Michael J. Fox, among many others who are on this journey that, I mean, there's absolutely nothing I can do about having Parkinson's, right? Nothing yet. Um, what I can do a lot about is how I live with it and, and what, I, what I do with it. And you know, for me, it's, it's been, again, about getting involved and, and trying to connect with people who enrich my life and that maybe I can help enrich their life and, um, and, and sort of doing this together. And so, um, you know, Michael J. Fox is the public face of Parkinson's. He is an extraordinary human being. Um, we would not be where we are today on the research side, on the social acceptance side, um, on the awareness side without him. And, you know, he has inspired me and continues to inspire me, as do many, many uh, less famous and known folks who are kind of grinding it out and, 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 and living daily with the challenges of this disease and, and, and making other people's lives better, or at least trying to. And so, um, you know, PDY is an outlet for that. The other kinds of work we've talked about is an outlet for that. And, and certainly the, the deep friendships I, I have made because of Parkinson's is an outlet for that. Uh, this next question, I, I think you've, you've answered um, the first part about supporting someone you love with Parkinson's disease, but um, what are some things that we shouldn't do um, that, for, you know, that friends and family shouldn't do? Um, I think like, a lot of things we, we shouldn't make assumptions about people and their experiences right um there are a lot of misperceptions about parkinson's and there are a lot of misperceptions about a lot of things mental illness uh included and we we really should should bracket our assumptions try to become more aware of them and educate our, ourselves 
Um, you know, I can only speak for myself, but, you know, I, I don't, I, I think this is fairly representative. I, I think most of us don't want, um, don't want to be seen as people who are defined by Parkinson's, right? It's, it's a part of our life. It's a very important part of our life for some of us, you know, certainly for me, not just on the medical side, but on the, the sort of vocational or, or calling side. But um, it, it doesn't define us. We're much more than our, our disease. And, um, you know, we want to we want to be seen and treated just like everybody else and, and recognized as kind of the multifaceted human beings that we are. And so I think, you know, don't pigeonhole people. Don't make assumptions about their their abilities or their inabilities to do things. Um, I write about this in the book a, a, a few weeks after I was um, diagnosed or after I became public with my, my diagnosis, I had lunch with a, a longtime, you know, friend and, and, and colleague um, who very seriously looked across the lunch table at me and said, you know, Alan, I'm so sorry to hear about your Alzheimer's diagnosis. And he caught himself and, you know, he turned a thousand shades of red and um, he, he knows the difference between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but um, not everyone does, as I would discover. And so I think um, trying to help educate people, but also people educating themselves on, you know, certainly people who are in their circles and in their lives whom they love about what they're experiencing can go a long way toward, uh, toward supporting them. Um, so those would be a couple of things I would suggest not to do. That was a really good example. Yeah. I let him off the hook though. He's a friend, you know, I, I was going to say, suffer too much. <laughs> I hope you made him pick up the bill. Oh, he, he bought, he bought lunch for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more question before our last reading? Sure. Um, how do you come to recognize some aspects of anticipatory grief or um, more ambiguous loss as you face the progression of the disease? That's a great question. Um, you know, ironically or serendipitously, I uh, or both, I, I I've spent a lot of my professional life, you know, studying bereavement. And, you know, I did my doctoral dissertation on bereavement. I've, you know, written a book on bereavement, um, thinking about another book on bereavement as we speak, articles, um, supported a lot of people through experiences of loss. And, you know, again, it was one of those scenarios where I, I kind of knew what was best for everybody else, but wasn't so great at, at taking my own sort of knowledge and advice and, and, and integrating it into my life. And so, um, having said that, you, you know, the last, you know, couple of years, at least, I think I've really, you know, gotten to a place where, um, you know, and, and this is really the, the kind of the meat of the book, I, I think living with, with any kind of chronic condition, progressive condition is, is really about learning how to live in the presence of grief and, and, and of loss, you know, you, we all envision a certain kind of life for ourselves, And of course, no one ever knows really if that's going to be the life that unfolds, but, but few, if any of us envision a life of sort of chronic illness, particularly in kind of young middle age. And so I think, you know, for me, and I, I know for others that I've talked with about this, it, it becomes sort of how do you, on the one hand, recognize the life you have yet to live and make that extraordinary in ways that you never thought would be possible while also recognizing the anticipatory grief um, that will come as, you know, functioning becomes more impaired, as disability becomes more a possibility, which for most of us um, will, will happen at some point. Um, uh, that's really important. And again, I think being in, in, in networks of people, being connected to people where you can reflect on that not just with a therapist, but, but in, in sort of friendship groups and um, you know, other kinds of personal networks is really important. And naming it and, and, and living into it and then um, sort of um, moving it, as I talk about in the book, sort of 
moving it to your periphery so that you can always see it. It's always there, but it doesn't live front and center in your life, right? And so, and I think that's true with most kinds of losses. We, we sort of have to do that, whether it's a, a loved one we've lost or a dream we've lost or um, a, an identity we've lost uh, as a healthy person or something like that. I think it's really about sort of learning how to live in the presence of that grief in ways that honor it, but also allow you that, um, that front and center vision to sort of move on, you know, with your life. So um, we're all on that journey, whether we have Parkinson's or not. I also think that's one of the um, wonderful things about in having your family and friends so informed and, um, you know, having them be able to go through that process with you both looking forward and peripheral about, you know, what, that you're all on that journey together. I yeah. really like that. Um, I admire that you've included your family in, in every step of the way. And I know that must have been really hard. Yeah, but it's um, been more rewarding than I ever would have imagined. So thank you. Would you like to close us out with another well, reading? Yes, thank you. This is a, the final reading. I know we don't have much time left. So um, uh, this is a reading from the epilogue, and I'm not going um, I'm not, I'm not to give away the ending of the book, but um, this, will, this will give you a little sense of, of what we talked about earlier. Somewhere near the small central town, uh, central Texas town of Wallace, I'm running my second of three legs in the Texas Independence Relay. It's after 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning in late March, nearly 15 months since the diagnosis that changed my life, and I haven't slept in 22 hours. I'm on a team of 12 runners. Five of us have Parkinson's, and all of us are touched by it through spouses and partners, family members, and friends. Our team captain and my new friend, Craig Potts, also lives with Parkinson's and has brought us together. We call ourselves Runners Against Parkinson's, and it'll take us nearly 36 hours to complete the 200-mile route, which began in the town of Gonzales and will end in Houston. We are more than halfway there. Navigating a rough dirt road, I have found a good running cadence under a clear starlit sky. It's warm, still, and quiet, and all I hear are my feet hitting the road and the air moving rhythmically in and out of my lungs. The LED headlamp strapped over my Houston Astros baseball cap shines a few feet in front of me, illuminating the tranquil light. If I turn my head slightly to the right or left, I glimpse a first swath of the massive fields of blue bonnets. My mind wanders back over the past year and a half and to the lessons I have learned about myself and others. Here are the lessons you asked for. Lessons about illness and resilience, about darkness and light. I've learned, for example, that medicine is at once miraculous and maddening, able to treat many diseases, including Parkinson's, but not necessarily able to cure them. This reality requires you to set expectations accordingly, hoping for better treatments and a cure, believing they will come because the science says so, while recognizing that progressive diseases progress and that to live means not betting it all on the future, but also cashing in on today. I've also discovered the incomparable healing power of living with greater openness and vulnerability, especially when tied to a measure of authenticity you never thought was possible. We wear masks after all and more often than we realize. Our masks can seal our pain, but they can also intensify it and allow it more of a destructive influence than it has to have. Although there are surely too many people in the world of whom we should never ask for more vulnerability, those who are poor, abused, neglected, marginalized, or victimized, many of us have much to gain by letting our guard down, at least for a bit, and allowing others to glimpse our humanity in its more exposed, 
and unvarnished forms. Kierkegaard said, are you not aware that there comes a midnight hour when everyone must unmask? If nothing else, Parkinson's has taught me the benefits of unmasking earlier than the midnight hour. Parkinson's will never define me, but it certainly guides me. Like an LED headlamp, it illumines paths in front of me. Those of illness and health, scarcity and abundance, suffering and joy, mystery and understanding. It also gets me out of myself, points me toward others and invites me to put PD to work on behalf of something good and life-giving. In this respect, I have learned the importance of embodying compassion which literally means to suffer with and joining with others to alleviate suffering. I've discovered that trying to help ease another person's pain or burden helps to lessen my own and that all of us who travel the Parkinson's road or one like it are sturdier, more resilient and more hopeful together. It gave me chills. Thank you. Um, we're at the top of the hour and I just want to tell you personally, this has been such an honor to, um, be a part of, of this book launch. Um, I appreciate so much your vulnerability and courage and, um, you know, the fact that you're willing to share this with all of us is just amazing. Uh, for those of y'all that are listening, um, Dr. Cole's a uh, book is available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble, probably any place that you can get books online now. Um, we put the link in the chat. And I also want to invite you to read his blog, pdwise.com. Uh, and uh, Dr. Cole's handle is pdwise on Twitter, Instagram, and, um, and it's also the name of your blog. Did I miss anything? No, you, you got it. And, and thank you, Jennifer, for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about the work uh, and to raise awareness. And, and again, thanks to all of you who came. Uh, it means the world to me that you would give an hour of your busy day to, to come and, and be a part of this. So uh, I'm in your debt. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon.